How do you do? In 1942, Christian writer C.S. Lewis wrote an apologetic novel called The Screwtape Letters. The story consists of advice a senior demon gives to his nephew, a junior tempter, in how to secure the damnation of a man known only as the patient. In this unshackled homage to Lewis's masterpiece, our program dramatizes this theme from the standpoint of what a senior demon might direct a younger demon to say and do today in order to keep us from having our hearts and minds and lives unshackled. You're late. Uh, yeah, uh, y you see what happened is... Stop talking. Right. You had one assignment. To be fair... You have failed. Well, it wasn't... Ex Shh. Our father below is quite displeased. Do not think that you will escape the usual penalties. Losing a patient to the enemy's side is certainly bad enough. Your patient has taken so seriously his conversion that he has joined a monthly Bible study. Weekly. What? It's a weekly Bible study. Worse still. Right. But all is not lost. This Bible study is part of a church, and one of our great allies at present is the church itself. We shall take advantage of this holy relationship your patient has, as it now takes us inside the enemy's camp, which makes us the enemy within. Presenting the anchor of our soul, this is Unshackled, True Life Stories dramatized and produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Now for broadcast around the earth, here is episode number 3,641 in the series, Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. Listening friend, God's church needs your commitment and participation now more than ever because we are in a spiritual battle. And the two most important things in any battle are knowing the terrain that is being fought upon and the enemy one is fighting. And what better way to learn one's enemy than to imagine the world through their eyes? So we approach today's episode from evil's perspective. We open our eyes to the tactics often used by the enemy, the devil and his demons, to entrap us. Listen close as we bring you this timely episode right now on Unshackled. Was waiting for their prayer to end. No, no. That's the time to distract. What if it's too late? It's never too late. We appeal to the one thing we have most in common with these dreadful humans. Pride. Oh, yeah, pride. We need only plant ideas in his mind that convince him of his own goodness and fairness, and then watch it spread. How can we be sure? Experience. If there's one thing we know about these humans, it's that most desire to be seen as virtuous to themselves and to their world. Therefore, you must push them towards a moralistic, therapeutic version of their faith. Moralistic, therapeutic. How do I do that? Get your patient to value being good over being right. Being good over being right. And to embrace feeling good about themselves over giving glory to our enemy. No, we, we don't want that. Instead of relating to the enemy, get him to focus on his relationships with other people. To feel virtuous in his service for them. <laughs> for example, have him focus on their economic condition rather than spiritual condition. More economic, less spiritual. You'll also be working with a partner. I have a partner. Well, our colleague, Glubdrub, has taken on a patient in this same Bible study. 
Glub Glub is particularly good at language tactics. Oh, yes. One of their weaknesses. Indeed. Control the language, you control the thought. Now, to drive our patients into this do-good, feel-good version of their faith, we've landed on the phrase social justice, or as we call it in my day, the social gospel. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Good. Thanks, Trish. So, you see... Social reform and political issues were not Jesus' focus. His was the will of God. When we are living in line with God's will, social issues are going to be impacted. But Jesus didn't come aiming to remodel the present world. Not even by peaceful means? No. no. Jesus' goals were eternally focused. He came to usher in a whole new eternal kingdom of righteousness, changing people. Instead of attempting to change governments or institutions. Which, hello, are made up of people, by the way. True, but that's the crux of it, Karen. Jesus came to change people's hearts and point them to God's kingdom. Right, Pastor? Uh, Good, Miguel. Well, I know who my sub is if I ever have to miss. (laughs) (laughs) But he had compassion for the poor. And he healed the sick. Of course he did. Yes, he showed deep compassion for all of the vulnerable. But before he took care of their physical or emotional needs, he took care of their souls and preached the gospel of repentance from sin so that they understood that their eternal destiny was far more important than their circumstances here on earth. But aren't we called to fight for the marginalized? Yeah, in my old Bible study, we focused a lot on social justice. What about saving souls? Isn't cultural restoration kind of like saving souls? No. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Wait. Being born again wasn't meant to be like a private thing, but more a prerequisite for joining a new public movement. Public movement? Yeah. You know, for redeeming society as a whole? Yeah, for the common good. (laughs) You mean collectively redeem people? Well, For example, in my old church, we did this with our climate justice ministry, which helps everyone. Climate justice ministry? But Karen, I left my old church for that reason. What reason? They focused on works instead of faith. My old pastor even started a ministry that was all about helping poor kids get new sneakers. That's good. But then the kids would get beat up and their sneakers stolen because they were new. That's bad. The ministry was called Preachers in Sneakers. That's worse. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) All right, all right. Bottom line is, it's not our words, our actions, or laws, or causes that save souls and transform lives. The only one who does that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he should be at the tip of our tongue and at the core of our motivation in anything we do. I tried. I just couldn't find a good opening. Glubdrub provided you a perfect setup. I know, but that pastor is sharp. You have an opening, you attack. I thought we were supposed to nudge our way forward. You said it. The safest road to... I know what I said. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one. A slow slide into the arms of our father below. But we are beyond that point. It's time for an all-out assault. On what? We go after their book. Oh, you mean their holy Bible? Don't say it. The sound of it sickens me. <laughs> that book has been at the forefront of more losses to the enemy than I care to think about. So how do we get them to reject it? We don't. We need only get them to question it. Now pay close attention. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Good, Pete. Uh, Read that last part one more time. Uh, And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart? Yeah. What does that mean? God judges our hearts? Yes. God reveals the truth about our thoughts and attitudes, if they're good or bad. Wait. See, I agree that God judges us on whether or not we believe in him as our Lord, 
but we don't get judged for not believing some of the other things that are in the Bible. Yeah, things from like 2,000 years ago. What, you think the Bible is outdated? Maybe. So, some stuff. Like? Uh, I don't know. Traditional marriage? Gender identity? What about the lives of the unborn? What about a woman's right to choose? Whoa, 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 hold on a minute. Wow, uh, look, the Bible clearly addresses all of those things, and in time we'll cover them, but getting back to our scripture, Pete, yes, there are things God doesn't approve of then and now. Those things haven't changed. God speaks to us and even rebukes us through his word. There, rebuke. That's what's hard to swallow. How do you mean? It's so judgy. Ditto. For non-Christians, it could feel... Harsh. Even intolerant. Okay, well, uh, do you agree that you can believe something sinful about someone's behavior and still love that person? Of course. Sure. Yeah, I hear that from my wife every day. <laughs> <laughs> right. Jesus calls us to love one another. And while loving that person... The reason you still believe what they're doing is sinful is because the Bible says so. Or it just feels wrong. What if it doesn't feel wrong? What if it's not fair? Then maybe you are basing your faith on your feelings instead of God's word. Mm. Uh, look at it this way. If God never tells you to do anything you don't want to do or believe anything you don't want to believe... Your God is probably you. Well, I am trying to think about th others. That's a stretch. When I first got to this country, I remember thinking, if there were an American translation of the Apostles' Creed, it might be something like, I believe in God the Father Almighty who always supports my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. You might be onto something there, Miguel. But when culture changes, shouldn't we look at the Bible through that prism? Uh, Karen, culture, fads, people come and go. But the Word of God is as relevant and accurate today as it was when it was first written. And all Scripture contains truth that we can and should apply to our lives today. I told you he was good. Yes, well, let me worry about the pastor. Until then, we keep attacking. But we've gone after their pride, their book. Every week, they just keep coming back like they depend on each other. That's it. That's it. We make them go after each other. <laughs> How do we do that? Let me see here. Well, some of our Marxist and postmodernist patients have carried out some effective strategies. Oh, yes, here we are. We've had success with these before. <laughs> uh, we will wage warfare with these tactics. Warfare on all fronts. Class warfare, race warfare, gender warfare. We have infiltrated their most valuable institutions. Government, media, academia, even their churches. Because what is our motto? Steal, kill, and destroy. That's right. And steal, kill, and destroy we will do. We'll hear more from the enemy within in just a moment. But first, Pacific Garden Mission President Phil Kwiatkowski and I have a special reminder for you. Hello, Pastor. Hi, Timothy. As we are all aware, we have an important election coming up next week. Indeed we do. And we as Christians need to be involved in the voting process. It is our civic duty, right? That's right. One of the great freedoms we have in this country is to have a say in who leads us and to be able to vote for leaders that represent our own worldview. And so without saying specifically who we should vote for, what issues should we focus on most as believers in Jesus Christ? As Christians, we should support and promote biblical issues and values. And obviously, because we are Christians, religious freedom and freedom of speech are important to us. Yes. These are rights we have as Americans, not as Christians. The Bible doesn't guarantee us these freedoms, but if we as Christians don't support and promote these freedoms, we could easily lose some freedoms that we enjoy as Americans. So, in other words, vote wisely. Vote biblically. Amen. Thanks, Pastor. We now return to our episode, The Enemy Within. But didn't we try that? Yes. 
There was a time when... And didn't it fail miserably? All right, it wasn't a complete success. Yeah, because it, like, killed a hundred million people. That was the successful part. But once they got wind of what communism and socialism really are, they worked hard to defeat them. Our patient, Marx, didn't really understand the desire for true freedom that the enemy planted inside these humans. Oh, they can be stubborn. The previous time we used this tactic, the goal was to pit them against each other using money and property. Those who had it versus those who didn't. <laughs> That's sneaky. Problem is, this freedom in a free market enabled them to change. Change their own economic status through their work ethic, education, talent, intelligence, etc., etc. Th then we can't really turn them against each other. Not unless we focus on what they cannot change. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Thanks, Miguel. So, what is Paul telling the Colossians here in chapter 2? Not to be deceived. Deceived by what? Ungodly things? Yeah, uh, more specifically... Deceptive philosophy. Yeah, highfalutin nonsense. Right. So... What would highfalutin nonsense look like today? New age. Reincarnation. Scientology. Hmm, good. Critical theory. Hmm. I didn't expect that one, but <laughs> sure. Wait a minute. That's not nonsense. I'm pretty sure it is. I'm pretty sure Christians should support it because Jesus cares about the oppressed. And I'm pretty sure I don't know what we're talking about. Well, Pete, uh... Critical theory is a way that culture attempts to explain power structures. Hegemonic power structures. Can, can we speak English, please? Uh, all right, I'll try to break it down. Critical theory is a philosophy that originated with a group of political philosophers who applied Karl Marx's ideas about economics to society as a whole. So what you end up with is power structures. Hidden power structures. Okay, uh, perceived hidden power structures that are behind society's problems. And institutions. It's dangerous stuff, Pete. It is rooted in cultural Marxism. One of the reasons we fled our home country and came to the United States. See, what it does is divide people and make them hate each other. Mm. It divides them along lines of oppressed and oppressor, depending on their race, gender... Sexual orientation. Even religion and income. Stuff like that. Oh, wait. This sounds familiar. I think I had this in one of my social science classes. I thought you were an accounting major. It was for freshman seminar. Feminist glaciology. Who knew that glaciers had a gender? But the important thing is there are those who have power and those who don't. Like I said, divided. Divided because those who have power always oppress those who don't. Always? How do we know which is which? Well, you're an oppressor because of your group identity. I'm an oppressor? Karen, I don't think we want to get into this here. Silence is violence. Silence is violence! All right, let's not... Hang on a second. Why am I an oppressor? Like we said, your race, gender, sexual identity, immigration status, any... I immigration status? Of course. Karen, I am in this country legally, but my cousin is not. Does that make me his oppressor? If you make more money than him, you are. Hi, hermano. Huh? Any form of disparity is injustice, therefore oppressive. Uh, wait, so I'm guilty of being an oppressor because of things I can't change? Pete, I'm not trying to be mean, but you are at the highest level of the power structure. Which I wasn't even aware of. Which is why, as a privileged person, you should probably stop talking and listen. You might learn something. This Bible study is off the hook! You mean off the rails. Are you just gonna let her- Karen, come on, that's not necessary. Pastor, with all due respect, your assertion of power over me right now is oppressive. And Pete, you can either stay an oppressor, which I'm pretty sure is not Christian, or you can get woke. I'm not doing anything! You have no moral authority to talk. You're still not being quiet. You just said silence is violence! You can get back moral authority, Pete, if you just surrender. Surrender what? Your power. Your oppressive whiteness. What? You're white! But I'm more oppressed than you because I'm a female, which gives me moral authority over you. 
So you have to listen to me. What about me? Well, you are Hispanic, but you're also a male, so I'm not sure where that puts us on the intersectional chart, but we're both oppressed by Pete and his whiteness. Oh. What? You gotta be kidding. <laughs> My wife is black. Am I oppressing her too? Yeah. Pretty much around the clock, which is a whole nother level of oppression. Come oh, on okay. in! Okay. Uh, you guys, you guys, guys. Uh, what would Jesus do? Oh, yes, you How was that for destruction? Oh, you have learned the art of accusation very well. <laughs> Our father below has a particular affinity for it. He will be pleased with your efforts. And it was good to finally see that pastor back on his heels. Yes, he seemed almost paralyzed by the chaos. I think he's afraid of offending people. Good. Good. <laughs> Apparently, his Master of Divinity degree didn't come with a spine. <laughs> <laughs> Though we must be careful. The enemy has proven that when these humans, in their wretched weakness, reach out to him for direction and strength, he more than provides. Understood. Now, continue to push this tactic of accusation between the patients. <laughs> Strive to make them feel isolated, angry, and guilty. They're not nearly as effective for the causes of the enemy when they are divided up and blaming each other. And most of all, if you can make your patient forget the enemy's love and faithfulness... Yeah, I'll get a promotion. Huh? No. No, you'll just not find yourself working the sewer pits in the basement. Uh, technically, we're already in the basement. It is hell, after all. Back to work. And last but not least, I have for Karen a uh, venti soy half-calf triple shot skinny caramel macchiato extra whip with three pumps, cinnamon dolce at 120 degrees. Right here. Thank you. All right, as I was starting to say before, I want to apologize to everyone for letting things get out of hand last week. I should have led better. We cannot let this stuff divide us. Yeah. Pastor, please don't be too hard so on important. Thank you, Pastor, for calling everyone together like this. Well, as believers, we must strive toward unity. But we also must be watchful about how a fallen world approach differs from what God would have us do. Bottom line, Critical theory and intersectionality are not consistent with Christianity. But they are part of social justice. And as believers, isn't that what we want? A biblical justice, yes. But critical theory has a different view of humanity than Christianity. It claims that our identity as human beings is rooted in things like race, gender. Things that differ from person to person. Right. But what does the Bible ground our identity in? It says in Genesis, we're created in God's own image. Which is something we all share. And as I learned last week, critical theory pits people against each other. Yeah. Sorry, Pete. I was kind of rough on you. Kinda? <laughs> <laughs> hey, what did your wife say about the whole thing? Oh, she said it was all hogwash. She said, Pete, we cannot have oppression when we have so much love. Aw, that's sweet. Yeah, then she made me clean out the garage. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the Bible says that we are all equal before God. How so? All created equal. Equally valuable. Equally guilty of sin. And equally deserving of punishment. Yet, equally able to find grace and mercy in Jesus. Good points all. But critical theory offers a different view of sin than Christianity. The Bible identifies sin as anything that violates God's design for people including unjust oppression of other people. But critical theory identifies sin only as oppression. What about sin among the oppressed? Well, according to critical theory, sins among the oppressed would be excused. But the Bible says we are all guilty before God. And because critical theory gets the problem wrong, it also gets the solution wrong. You mean salvation? Exactly. So, according to the Bible, because we are equally guilty of sin, where is our salvation found? It can only be found in Jesus through repentance. And so our hope is... Found in being forgiven and cleansed of sin. Yet critical theory teaches that oppressors are guilty and the oppressed are not. Therefore, salvation for the oppressed is found not through repentance, 
but in social liberation. Oh, no. Guys, I've been pushing this social activism stuff as our hope. Karen, neither we nor our causes can solve our biggest problem. Right. But Jesus can. And that's why our hope is not in our circumstances on Earth, but our destiny in eternity. Mm -hmm. Yes, goodness. All right. So that wraps this study series. Thank God. (laughs) (laughs) And we can start again next month with a whole new one. So if you have any ideas, just let me know. Oh, I've got one. Okay, Karen. Why Jesus was a socialist. Oh, no. Karen. Karen. What? Karen. I mean, please. Hey, you guys. Don't, don't, don't go. Hey, you're not going to pay for my coffee? All right, let us get started, Blub Drop. Isn't he going to join us? Who? Your, your nephew. Oh, he wasn't pulling his weight for our father below, so he was uh, transferred. Now... Our next mission involves another church. You will be assigned to a patient we've already deeply corrupted. He's working for our father below? Technically, yes. He just doesn't know it. He's all about fixing systemic oppression and ridding the world of injustice. Keep him focused on that and away from the real gospel. But what if my patient ends up in a Bible study with a good pastor? Why, Glub Drop, your patient is the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Listening friend, right now there is a wind of madness blowing over the world, a setting cloud of darkness. The goal of this darkness is to accuse and divide. We must resist it. And so, consider this a clarion call to all of our brothers and sisters in Christ to stand up for what's right and stand against what's wrong. We must stand against the cultural Marxist tactics that are embedding themselves today in our society and even into some of our churches. The worldview that rejects the reality of sin will also blind those living in sin from seeing the necessity of salvation. Friends, the only way to bring about restoration into this fallen world is to pursue the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Now, to all that are called to proclaim the gospel, as a whole, your voice is mighty in its breadth and power, but you must use it. We are on the brink of revolution, and we are in want of a generation of ministers of the gospel who are prepared to boldly fulfill their calling, come what may. You must preach now with firm adherence to the word and with greater conviction and urgency than ever before. If you'd like to reach out to get in touch with us at Unshackled, you can write to us at Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. The telephone number in Chicago, 312-492-9410. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. Visit our website to learn more about this ministry, unshackled.org. This is program number 3641. Heard in The Enemy Within were Brad Armacost, Michael Walner, Cheryl N. Galemo, Tom McElroy, Jennifer Dimmitt, and Demetrius Troy. Original music and audio engineer Don Badorf. Sound effects Demetrius Troy. Recording engineer David Pierczynski. Unshackled is produced by Pacific Garden Mission to show through true stories that if your life is empty, it can be filled to overflowing. Thanks for listening, and may God bless you. <laughs>